Well, hello, everyone. I am so happy to have you here with us. And um, my name is John Award, and I run the Seattle Public Library Foundation. And I am so excited for this event tonight. We uh, have been putting together something pretty special and, and in years in the making. Uh, so first off, before we begin, I want to take a moment and start with a land acknowledgement. You know, we are of the Seattle Public Library and it's on Indigenous land. These are the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish people, past and present. And we acknowledge this land with, with deep gratitude. Now, we are often asked, why? Why do we do this? And we love that question because... As an organization, we are deeply committed to equity and to learning. Those are two fundamentally important things to us. And as the Duwamish tribe puts it, for non-Indigenous communities, land acknowledgement is a powerful way to show respect and honor the Indigenous peoples of the land where we work and we live. And this acknowledgement is just simply a way that stops or resists the erasure of Indigenous histories. And it really works toward honoring and inviting truth and, and knowledge. So we encourage you to learn about the land we're on. Of course, we want you to use the library in order to do that, to study, to research, and to understand, and hopefully act in a way that is inspiring by for you. And uh, yes, thank you for, for a moment of reflection there. Now, I'm just wanting to start by saying thank you to so many of you. You're our donors, you're our advocates, you're library supporters, and you're here with us tonight. And we're excited to say or show one of the ways that your support is inspiring the next generation of young leaders through our library collections. You know, libraries, this is titled Libraries Inspire Civic Courage. And I think that that has a lot of different meanings. And whether it's about the scholarship we'll be talking about tonight, whether it's capturing those histories and, and having them part of our special collections, or new and very bold initiatives like Books Unbanned, all of those things really come back to this idea around civic courage, what's important, how do we protect our democracy, and all the things that we really love and, and make our, our lives and our communities healthy and vibrant. Now, the scholarship is a very unique program for us, um, and it came about a decade ago. So Stim Bullet, uh, he was somebody maybe you probably, your lives were touched by one way or the other. Uh, he was a lawyer. He was a decorated soldier, an outdoorsman, a climber, a civic rights activist, a developer, a philanthropist, a broadcaster, an environmentalist, and a community leader and came from a really important foundational family to Seattle. Um, the Bullitt family as a whole have had long ties to Seattle public. And STEM to this day is still the most generous uh, individual donor to the library and the library foundation through his estate. It was an incredible gift that has far reaching uh, implications to our library system and what it's been able to do. So early on working with Tina Bullitt, his widow, who is with us tonight, uh, the idea of how to honor Stam and, and the legacy he had created in the library. And really it, uh, that's how the idea of the scholarship was, was born. It was about bringing together you know, important things to him and where the library fit into this. And so this idea around recognizing and thinking about people who have gone against the kind of prevailing winds, who have stood up for things they believe in, uh, that was really important to STEM. And to Tina, education, scholarship, students being able to have opportunities was equally important. And so for us here at the library and the Library Foundation, it really became a win-win-win all the way around because not only does it support students and honor STEM, but it really created some amazing content that is now part of our special collections and will continue to be part of our, our collections. So for the past 10 years, we've had the opportunity for local students to write essays about individuals or groups in the state of Washington who demonstrate civic courage as in, on an important issue and often with great political and personal risk. Now the essays each year are reviewed and winners are selected and one of the fun twists to this from the very get-go was that the 
the winning papers are actually read and ranked by some very special esteemed author and historian judges, including one you'll meet tonight um, and one who won't be here tonight, but who's been here from the beginning. And that was John Krakauer, who, you know, through the, the love of environment and climbing and all those things, he and STEM had a relationship. But beyond that, it's the scholarship really serves as a learning point. Think of the number of papers, hundreds of papers that have been written about people from our community. Often the library is used to as a resource, especially our special collections. And it's about creating stories and connections to things that really impact our lives and our democracy. And you're gonna hear some fun ones tonight with, with the students who are a pretty inspiring group that have gone on and several have made activism really part of their lives. So there are other things in addition to the scholarship, you will be hearing from Tom Fay. Tom Fay is our chief librarian. Um, and we are incredibly proud of the library's work that's really about inspiring and expanding access for young people to our collections. And just this week, um, if you're in the state of Mississippi and you're a young person, anyone under 18, you cannot even access their digital collections any longer. I mean, we are working in a time that has radically changed. And yet here we are in Seattle and with the support of donors, we are able to make our collections available to any young adult in the United States. And I like to say that this is the time where um, you start to do things differently. When you are faced with challenges, just like the many people we'll hear about and the, the young uh, authors who have written about, um, you do stuff differently. And so I wanna give a huge shout out to our friends from the Brooklyn Public Library. In fact, I think there are a few staying up late to join us. Um, they were the first to introduce this idea of Books Unbanned, which makes um, our digital collections available. So Brooklyn started it, we joined on, and uh, we're working to help get other libraries across the country. So you're gonna hear more about that from our chief librarian, Tom Fay. But before we do that, we actually are gonna have some of the winners here with us. And there's a panel moderated by Kristen Millaris Young. Uh, Kristen has been one of our judges. Um, she's also the author of the novel, Subduction. She's the editor of Seismic, Seattle and the City of Literature. She's a distinguished visiting writer at Seattle U and UW Bothell. She's a teacher. She's a writing workshop instructor. She's a prize winning journalist, an essayist, and just an incredible example for the young people. Uh, and she's also a library supporter. But what was really lovely when Kristen got involved with the essay, she was just so generous with her time and offer to the students to, uh, if they wanted to talk with the writer and wanted more feedback, she was she made herself available. And that's been another really unique aspect to this scholarship. Now, as we get closer to this, we're actually gonna start uh, with a kickoff with a little video. It's in uh, some of the students, some you'll meet, some you won't, but you're gonna hear more about the scholarship and the impact it's had. And this was produced by Trial and Error Productions. And we just wanna give a shout out of thanks to board member Lauren Dudley and her team, which included Whitney Beshaw, uh, Sarah Overman, and Christine Tram. And then of course the video has a, has a cameo appearance by, uh, or maybe more than a cameo, by Seattle Public Libraries, Anne Ferguson. She's the curator of Seattle Collection. And you know, Anne has just been a treasure to us and is a treasure to so many people and has helped uh, with this process. Now with over 10 years of scholarship, we have had some amazing students and young people They've, of this, a couple former win winners who were early on, who are moving on into their career. One is a policy advocate for the National Congress of American Indians. Another is a data reporter for public, uh, ProPublica. Another is a Fulbright scholar in Columbia. But they all are distinguished. They all are amazing and have such strong voices. And there's nothing in this uh, scholarship except for strong voices. That's the type of writing it took to, to win and a lot of personal connection to the people they're writing about. So we'll watch the video and then we'll have three of our special guests live. I cannot wait for you to meet them. 
We are recording this evening. Uh, and so I think everybody had to give permission there. If you need any kind of technical assistance as we go through this, uh, the team is standing by. So um, you'd be able to use the chat or questions um, to get to them. And um, again, I think with that, I just want to say thank you. And I really hope you enjoy this program. The library plays an important role in supporting democracy and freedom of information and access. If you think about what true democracy is, it, it depends on the informed consent of the people. And to do that, people need to have access to information and knowledge. So I think just fundamentally a library is a challenge to censorship or inequity just just by its very existence. They're also open spaces for free expression, learning about different opinions and experiences. If you want to be able to actively engage with your own democracy, if you want to be able to actively understand your own country, you need to be able to have access. Giving resources to kids who don't have it is working for the future. My name is Luisa Moreno, and I won the Stim Bullet Civic Courage Scholarship in 2016 uh, by writing an essay about the Gang of Four. My name is Quinn Manson Bookwald. I wrote about Bernie White Bear, who was one of like the infamous Gang of Four major civil rights and racial rights leaders in Seattle. My name is Deborah Tesfaye. I won the Stim Bullet Scholarship in 2020, and I wrote about Cyrus Habib. My essay chronicles the life of Dr. Nettie J. Asbury, a black civil rights activist who established the first NAACP chapter in the Pacific Northwest. One of the most inspiring stories from Dr. Asbury's life was when she and her fellow activists successfully organized to prevent Washington from banning interracial marriage. For my scholarship essay, I wrote about Wing Luke, an eminent scholar and activist for Chinese American rights, as well as Seattle's first ever non-white city councilman. For my Stin Bullet scholarship essay, I wrote about Deborah Park, a Tulalip tribe member and activist. The inspiration I took from Deborah Parker is to re-examine the systems of oppression around us and seek ways to improve the lives of our community members by stepping up and facing challenges. The Stin Bullet essays played an important role in the Seattle collection because the essays are often focused on people, individuals, who've done some amazing things for our community, shown civic courage, but sometimes are not as well known to the community at large. I believe that civic courage is about acting bravely in the face of social injustice. It's about leveraging grassroots activism, organizing, and using our democratic institutions in order to create change. The libraries have given me access to texts written by people with tremendous civic courage, with perspectives from activists, people who are living those experiences, and that's helped make me a more informed citizen and made me more thoughtful about those issues. You can find a book on pretty much anything from anywhere in the world in the Seattle Library. One of the beauties of the library is that when you do have questions about why is this neighborhood underserved? Why is this neighborhood overserved? Being able to look at more of those archival materials, minutes from meetings, maps drawn up by the city, these things that are that are kept, that are curated, are essential for, for research, for understanding. Libraries play an integral role in providing open access to information that would otherwise be gatekept by private institutions. They're one of the last bastions of truly free knowledge, and they contribute vitally to a forum of open discussion and exchange of ideas that's essential to the democratic system. You know, I think sometimes we take for granted that the library is open to all. Anyone can walk into this library and are provided with whatever it is that they want to see and to research. And that's a great gift to the city. Hello, everyone. I'm Kristen Miatis Young. I am an author, a journalist, an essayist, and a proud Seattle Public Library patron. I've also served for the past three years as an essay judge for the Stim Bullet Civic Courage Scholarship. Uh, my fellow authors, John Krakauer, Stacey D. Flood, and I reviewed this year's submissions. And for many years, we were joined by the late, great Jonathan Rabin. Reading and elevating the work of emerging writers from our community is a real privilege. 
Each year, we receive dozens of submissions from local students, well-researched, well-written, and illuminating local leaders who are often overlooked by our history. The winning essays become part of our library's permanent collection, where they will inspire future readers and writers looking for information on civic participation. Now, library collections play a unique and essential role in our society. Free entry points for stories and knowledge about our shared history and the impacts of civic engagement. Inspiring civic involvement, particularly among young people, is essential for the long-term health of our society and democracy. Young people participating in the STEM Bullet Civic Courage Scholarship over the past decade have engaged with our library to learn about and draw inspiration from people they have identified as civic heroes. In many cases, these students have gone on to greater activism in their own lives, and I can tell you as a judge, I have been consistently impressed and inspired by their attention to detail, by their narrative, by their impassioned excavation of the contributions of these people to our society. I'm very happy tonight to be joined by three such young people. Sonia Kamenini won first place in 2023 for her excellent essay on Ramona Bennett. Sonia received her International Baccalaureate Diploma with an award in social studies from Ingram High School in 2023. She looks forward to beginning her undergraduate studies at the University of Washington this fall. Welcome, Sonia. Juliana Folta won first place in 2021 for her insightful essay about Deborah Parker. Juliana graduated with a Bachelor of Applied Sciences in Sustainable Practices and will start her Master of Social Work degree in fall of 2023, pursuing a career in mental health counseling. She has a strong passion for advocacy and finding creative ways to live sustainably. Welcome, Juliana. Eric Anthony Sousa Ponce was runner-up in 2021 for his extraordinary essay on Billy Frank Jr. Eric Anthony has worked for the NAACP was a founding member of the We Lead Us BIPOC Youth Mentoring Program, president of Ballard High School Students and Teachers Against Racism, and a 2021 honoree of the Princeton Prize in Race Relations. He is a rising junior at Western Washington University, where he studies communications and sociology, and is a varsity athlete with their nationally ranked track and field team. He hopes to continue his racial justice advocacy work on a professional level in the future. Welcome, Eric Anthony. I'm deeply grateful that your writings, all of you, will be part of the library's permit collections. It's incredibly important that future people include, I mean, I learned so much from reading your essays uh, that I know that this uh, contribution to the canon will continue to bear fruits. So thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Um, I'd like to go ahead and dive in. This first question is for everyone. You all wrote essays about indigenous leaders. Was this history that you were taught growing up in Seattle? And what opened up to you about indigenous history and civil rights and learning about these leaders? We'll start with Juliana. Yes, absolutely. I feel like learning about indigenous history has been a huge missing piece of my education in the public school system. Although I was raised in the US territory of Guam, which is you know, kind of near Japan, I like to say, um, I moved to Washington state for high school in the search of better opportunity. Um, and in my education here, I only was uh, given one opportunity to learn about indigenous rights in a ninth grade Washington history class. And it really only framed indigenous lives uh, in its relationship to colonization and really not much about the history or the culture of the peoples. And so by diving into the scholarship essay, I was really able to not only really dive into the world of what it means to be indigenous in our state, but also teach myself what I think I needed to be teaching, taught from day one. Um, yeah, and so it really also came from my childhood of having a grandfather who worked as a lawyer for indigenous peoples in Alaska, in the small town of Haynes for the Klingit people. That was also able to give him, be given that exposure to how important it is to honor the indigenous people's cultures that surround us and that really built way to successful life today in our state. Truly the forever stewards of this land. And Sonia, you uh, profiled uh, Puyallup leader Ramona Bennett. Um, was this history that you were taught growing up in Seattle? 
Yeah, so I was born and raised in Seattle and growing up, I learned a lot about the history of indigenous communities in Washington and Seattle within school. Um, in seventh grade, I had an indigenous history teacher who I think she really opened up my eyes to this, the indigenous communities in Washington because I think that her lens gave us a really unique perspective and her emphasis within the curriculum really sparked my own interest. Um, I think that one thing my specific essay demonstrated to me was the adversity that civic leaders often face from within their own community. I mean, um, Ramona Bennett, she faced challenges, you know, she was as an indigenous rights activist, she faced challenge from the US government and from law enforcement. But also as a woman, she was ostracized within her own community and often disrespected by many of the people whose civil rights she was fighting for. And I think it was those challenges that really stood out to me and demonstrated just all the ways that um, civic rights leaders like face challenges. Truly, the struggle for equal rights needs to be intersectional. So thank you for bringing up how patriarchal oppression continued to work its uh, forces on her, even as she was advocating for the community. Um, Eric Anthony, uh, I really enjoyed reading your essay about Billy Frank Jr. Could you talk a little bit about, did you learn that history growing, you know, in Seattle and what did it open up for you uh, during the research process? For sure, yeah. So um, I moved to Seattle a few years ago with my family and uh, I think Julian, Juliana said it very well, excuse me, that like the only time that we really see ourselves as racialized people represented within the curriculum is when it is due to a traumatic relationship with whiteness. So like we only learn about, you know, black history, they call it because of slavery, which is, you know, a trauma that's been inflicted by white people. And we learn about uh, indigenous peoples because again, of trauma inflicted by white people. And so I didn't know anything from school about even my own indigenous roots. Everything that I know about where I come from is uh, entirely due to my mother. So shout out to you, mommy. I know she's watching this right now. Um, but I learned about Billy Frank Jr. actually because I was uh, testifying on a uh, school board meeting about something completely different, but still related to racial justice. And then there was other racial justice advocates who were advocating for uh, making Billy Frank Jr. a recognized holiday within Seattle Public Schools. So I started to research who this was and, you know, he's really, um, he, he stood out to me, he spoke to me. So that's who I decided to write about. I'm very glad that you did. Um, now, Juliana, you described your experience about writing about Deborah Parker as important because the story was underrepresented and a lot of the information was not accessible online. Um, why was it meaningful to be able to access uh, information about her through the library and what struck you most during that process? Absolutely. I think the revelation that it was so hard to find information about such an important story about fighting for domestic violence rights of marginalized women, it really reflected that it's so vital to fill gaps in historical narratives and amplify marginalized voices so that those stories are not lost. Uh, and really by writing this essay, I was really inspired by the resiliency that really shone through, through Deborah Parker in this fight where she had to fly from one side of the country to the other, spreading her word, knocking on doors. That shows that resiliency is so important and it it helps us thrive as people. Um, and by observing that in the story, we can really come together as a community and go forward with that in our hearts and minds, knowing that if we just keep going, that there's light at the end of the pathway to make a really positive difference in our communities and nations. Unfortunately, uh, for the individuals, but truly uh, of great benefit to the community is that resilience is a quality cultivated you know, over time under duress and against the odds. Uh, and so for those who are able to make contributions despite these strong countervailing winds, uh, we all owe them a debt of gratitude. Um, Eric Anthony, you stated that during this time, it's important to look back at the tactics and strategies of organizers from the past and learn from the ways that they collaborated and work toward liberation together. What lessons did you learn that might benefit today's activists uh, from the example of Billy Frank Jr. and the other past civic leaders? Yeah, so I like to start off by, you know, putting out there that oppression didn't start um, in the time of Billy Frank Jr. And it definitely didn't end at that time either. And as long as there has been oppression, uh, there has been movements for liberation. So this is going back thousands and thousands of years, you know, nothing new under the sun. Um, 
which also shows that all of the tactics that are used today are tactics that have been around for thousands of years. You know, going back to biblical times, right? We see, um, you know, Jesus Christ, even as a historical figure, preaching nonviolence. And then who do we see in the 1960s preaching nonviolence is Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? So we see um, him being informed by his predecessors as well as the people today. And then also to balance that out, you know, using the same example as Dr. King, um, on the other side of that, we have, you know, the Black Liberation Army who were uh, exercising the Second Amendment rights to a well-regulated militia. And so as it pertains to Native Americans, right, we have Billy Frank Jr. who preached nonviolence. And then we had the American Indian Movement, who, again, was a well-regulated militia who occupied, you know, Alcatraz, Wounded Knee, that sort of thing. Uh, yesterday marks the beginning of the 33-year anniversary of a standoff, uh, a violent standoff between the Mohawk peoples and uh, the colonial Canadian governments. Um, it's also important to, when we speak about violence, to say that no struggle for liberation is ever inherently nonviolent because oppression itself is violent. So um, this is all just a continuation is the point. You know, there's like, we're going to be stuck if we don't learn from what's happened before and implement that. And there are many kinds of violence, right? Like the scholar Sadia Hartman talks about the erasure of uh, marginalized voices and voices that have been raised in their time for liberation. She talks about the erasure of that from the archive as a kind of violence. And so I really see the contributions of each of you and other STEM bullet, uh, civic courage scholarship winners and, and runner up and contrib contributors as helping to act as a corrective to that violence of the archive. So thank you for that. Um, Sonia, you said that you've seen libraries as equalizers of knowledge, creating a space where anyone can access independent education, particularly about topics of activism. How is the library used among your peers uh, and what topic are students exploring? Yeah, great question. Thanks. So um, during high school, I was part of the International Baccalaureate Program, which if you don't know what that is, it's essentially an, interdiscipl an interdisciplinary program where students take IB classes, kind of similar to AP and tests in them. And part of the requirements to get your diploma is to write what they call an extended essay or EE, which is basically like an independently guided kind of mini thesis paper. Um, and I think it was during this process that I really saw my peers start to use libraries um, in a new way for academic and thorough research, kind of just like outside of their own enjoyment, but also for education. Um, and I think that the great thing about the EE was that you can really choose any subject as long as you can connect it back to a discipline like the arts or math. Um, so it was really interesting to see my classmates take on the new challenge of kind of using libraries as an educational resource, but also doing so in a way that genuinely interested um, them. And for me during this process, the library was crucial because I know that I would not have been able to get a lot of the resources and a lot of the information I needed to write this paper without them. That's a great segue into my final question for you as panelists, uh, although we are very much welcoming audience questions, and I would encourage anyone of uh, the dozens who are here to bear witness to this flourishing to drop a question into the chat, and I'll uh, circle back to them in, in a minute. Um, but Juliana, um, how does expanding access to libraries engage young people, not just in reading what they want to read, but kind of increasing civic engagement? Yeah, I mean, even for me growing up as a child, I was shown how important libraries are in teaching information literacy skills. So even how to evaluate sources, discern between fact and fiction, critically analyze information, all of these skills that the library really strengthens in children from a young age, allow us to make more informed decisions engage in constructive dialogue, become responsible digital citizens in our new emerging world, um, and really explore topics like democracy, social justice, human rights, um, and this examination of informational literacy, we're able to really take a step back and look at a whole world in a really holistic view and engage in democracy in a really insightful way. Thank you. Uh, you know, it is uh, taking a step back is necessary, right, to see uh, the gains that can be made and also the losses that we are experiencing as a society uh, collectively as uh, books get brought offline. Uh, so, Eric Anthony, I want to ask you as well, 
How can expanding access to libraries engage young people? Yeah, um, I have a friend who I've done a lot of, you know, racial justice work with, who has a quote that I love to, I go, I go around and say it like every day to everybody, people get sick of me, but it is that uh, our education is our liberation. And um, as we, as we fight for liberation, you know, we see every means of that being limited by, uh, by the systems that are already in power. So currently, you know, we are seeing examples of uh, book bans, right, which is, you know, not to sound corny, but that's like proto-fascism, you know, um, limiting access to uh, these educational resources, limiting access to our liberation. And so, like, you, you think of the concept of a library, and it's like, this is something that would never get implemented in our current political climate. This is, this is like socialized education, you know, what is this? Um, and we need to be clinging on to every single resource that we have that can, you know, help educate us and lead to our liberation. Liberation is not a linear process, right? Uh, so thank you all for engaging. Uh, I look really forward to um, to bringing in the audience questions. I see that we have things uh, coming into the chat already. Uh, thank you so much. But first, uh, we're going to hear from our chief librarian, Tom Fay, about how the library approaches access to knowledge for young people in the new Books Unbanned program. Thanks for being here, Tom. Thanks, Kristen, and uh, pleasure to be here with you. So let's start with a little bit of personal background. Uh, you grew up in a small community in Nevada and started going to and then working at public libraries from a young age. Can you talk a little bit about what the library meant for your perspective in the world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, growing up in that uh, small town, it was about 900 people, uh, majority uh, white, um, pretty limited worldview. And for me, it really allowed me to explore the world outside of that little uh, farming and ranching community and can't imagine not having it. it really is what drove me to uh, be a first generation uh, college student and um, I really wanted to be able at the time um, to explore um, history and art I did both um, I got the art degree but um, I wouldn't have been able to do that without that small little library um, who had a librarian who got books for me every month um, and it didn't matter what I wanted to read. She brought them in from the big city um, out to our little town every month. So how did Books Unbanned start coming together? And what have you heard from your peers in libraries across the country? Well, I mean, Books Unbanned, we have our colleagues here, I think, listening from Brooklyn Public. Um, if they're all still awake here uh, in the late hours on the East Coast. But, you know, I know they were seeing, uh, much like we were, um, over a year ago, well over a year ago, additional um, attack on um, a variety of authors, a variety of subjects, um, and really impeding, starting to impede everyone's ability to learn, and in some cases, even know about ideas or perspectives. And that was very concerning for us when we saw, um, obviously, their um, courageous work um, being the first to do that. Our teams were in touch with them pretty early on and uh, afterwards what we did was you know took their lessons learned over the course of a year and the program really um, is intended to for us at Seattle Public and I believe it's similar at Brooklyn is to provide uh, youth 13 to 26 an e-card and they can check out any of our e-books or e audible books that we have um, thousands upon thousands of titles and items and of course, Brooklyn is also in that same uh, mix with us um, and have that, has that availability as well. Um, we're happy um, to say that there's more libraries talking about coming on. Um, and it's, um, it's a huge piece to have more to share this load. And really for us um, at the old public, when we looked at this, often libraries go and create their own marketing and, and try to uh, create that special thing for their community, but we really thought it was important to use the same marketing, the same graphics, um, to uh, entitle it under one title, not many, um, and really to try to drive this at a national level to really raise up the issue of censorship and how bad it is getting out there. There are numerous states now that are passing laws that actually will fine or imprison librarians if they provide this information. And we have to have a counter to that argument and that approach. Well, I have we to say that. 
And we couldn't have done this, Chris, without our foundation. I mean, this is all privately funded. Um, it is a massive uh, commitment, um, and I appreciate all the donors that have contributed to it already, and the more that are still coming on every day. It's, it's um, greatly appreciated, and we couldn't do it without them. So I was uh, raised by uh, Cubans uh, who taught me, uh, having had to leave their own country, uh, that libraries are the crown jewel of this democracy. It has been in a state of shock and horror to see this regression uh, to what Eric Anthony so aptly called this kind of fascism uh, and uh, the creation of a deeply ignorant um, populace through the removal of the books that they need to learn. So I really credit the Seattle Public Library Foundation and the Books on Band program uh, for helping to make these resources available. Um, what's been the response from young readers thus far? It's uh, been very enthusiastic. Um, in two and a half months since the launch, we've had um, over 3,000 young people sign up in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. Uh, most of the, I would say most of the signups are from California, Florida, Texas, um, and communities right here in Washington that are outside of King County and uh, often on the east side of the state. Um, these cardholders have checked out more than 9,000 titles. Uh, over 12,000 times and have 4,300 titles on hold. So it's uh, uh, going well in just um, 60 plus days. Um, we've seen a lot of comments come in from folks. And I, I'm going to share some and, and spend a moment because I think this shows the um, impact. And these, um, these comments range from young people um, as young as 16 all the way into their 20s. Um, here's one from Alabama. There are very few books with any minority characters at the libraries in my state. So I never see people like myself represented in written media. Audiobooks are more available online, but I'm deaf and I can't use them. Having access to ebooks online is an amazing opportunity. In Oregon, 24 year old, I live in a rural area where everyone knows everyone and don't feel comfortable checking out LGBTQ stuff from the library there. I'm sure the librarians would be respectful, but I'm not so sure about the other patrons. Age 17, Michigan. A group of parents are trying to remove certain problematic books from my high school's English curriculum. I want to be able to read these books and others, but I can't always afford to buy them. I can use this card to read what I want to read without worrying about the financial burden. Age 23 from Florida. Florida is banning so many books right now and access to books by queer, and people of color authors is so important, especially to young people. And then from North Carolina, 17 year old, this card would give me full permission to use my free time to learn and think rather than scrolling through my phone. I want to actively engage with the world and new ideas. And those are just a few. I mean, there are others that are um, heartbreaking. Um, people have shared with us, um, and I think you see it from small towns all the way to large cities um, and large states with a very big population. So I think that's what's critical to understand, right, is that uh, this is affecting a large swath of the American youth and the future that they hold in keeping with their ideas. And um, I wonder what you see, Tom, as the role of the library and young people in standing up to censorship efforts moving forward. Well, it's it's huge. Um, these generations coming up are going to be some of the largest populations that we've had um, since the baby boomers. Um, libraries are having to band together, as you see here today, that you know we are stronger together than we are apart in our individual community. Um, but we also know that young people will need to get out to vote. The thing that changes this is that voting, it is a commitment to civic life um, and all the strife that that may mean as we have to push back on folks who want to take away people's right to know, learn, and grow. And so that's one of the things I always challenge young people with. Is I, I've spent 40 years in this and 40 years working through all levels of government. It's, it never ends. Um, it is something that is a long um, fight, and it is a good fight. It is making things better for everyone. And I think that's what um, always inspires me when I see um, and hear what we've heard today 
from our scholarship recipients, um, amazing individuals, every single one. Um, but they've got to stay engaged. It's not, you know, the next president happens to be somebody we want. You got to come back the next time and you got to get them reelected again or get another group in there. We can't let things um, diminish to the point that we have these attacks. It doesn't take long. In 40 years, this is the worst I've seen it. Um, and that, that's saying something. I've lived through a lot of different things in, in that 40-year career, but this is the most well-funded, well-organized, and most certainly politically divisive um, approach that we've seen um, in my career. And truly, it is a diminishment, and it diminishes us all. And I'm so grateful for your leadership. I'm grateful for the Seattle Public Library Foundation and for the Books Unbanned program. Uh, I'd like to have one final question for Sonia, uh, who won uh, this year's with her insightful, kaleidoscopic, uh, attentive essay about Ramona Bennett. Sonia, I'd like for you to come on camera. Thank you. Um, I wonder, you know, having spent so much time studying and then, you know, narrating the life of Ramona Bennett, what of her tactics uh, might you bring into your own life, your studies, uh, your choices? Um, yeah, I mean, just with my life now, like going into college, thinking about career options, I think that a lesson that Ramona Bennett can teach anyone, you know, whether activism is a large part of your life or not so much, is um, perseverance, which I think she really demonstrates more than um, most other people I've seen. I mean, she faced so much adversity with through her life, you know, whether that was from her own community, like she was arrested several times when she was participating in the fissions and her takeovers. Um, and yet she continued with what she was passionate about, which was indigenous, right? Indigenous civil rights. And she found a lot of success. She had an enormous impact in like um, both like within Seattle and nationally as well. She co-wrote the Indian Child Welfare Act. She's um, founded several leagues and um, for the like protection of urban Native Americans. And um, I think that, I don't know, this is like her story is so inspiring because despite all the obstacles she faced, she was able to do this and she turned it into her life's work, which I think I don't know, is really cool. It seems a lot of times with uh, civic leaders that the things that they bring, that they dedicate their lives to also bring their lives uh, back to them, right? Uh, ICWA was recently uh, reaffirmed, uh, which was of a great relief to all, I believe, uh, the tribes who had advocated so ceaselessly to preserve it against the well-coordinated efforts of those who wish to divest Indigenous communities from their children. Uh, so I am grateful to her. Uh, I'm grateful to you, Sonia, and to you, Juliana and Eric Anthony, for your work, and uh, and to you, Tom. So I'd like to hand it back to Jonna, uh, who's going to uh, tell us a bit more about that ongoing work of the Seattle Public Library Foundation. Thank you, Jonna. Thank you so much. Oh, I told you this would be fun. Uh, these are amazing things, and you know when you think about. I think along the way, we call this inspiring the next generation. Um, actually feels it's like uh, maybe more of the other way around. It's like this generation inspiring us. There's some amazing young people here, and it's just truly an honor to, to be able to do this tonight. You know, one of the key ways that this actually gets done is by our colleague, Jill Demon. And I'm not sure, I'm guessing Jill might be listening in tonight, um, but it takes a lot of um, effort for outreach to spread the word. Uh, Jill works with library staff and then our teen librarians through both library branches and uh, visits into high schools. Uh, they help spread the word. It also is promoted through the different scholarship sites that exist and, and our social media and as well as the libraries. So getting word out about the scholarship opportunity come September, we'll, we'll really gear up into that and then the actual applications open in January. But I, I feel good. I feel inspired by what we've just heard. Um, you know, the, the, the track of conversation, the topics we touched on, there is so much that is so fresh and relevant. 
And often it comes right back to democracy and First Amendment rights and, and really protecting the things that we believe deeply in. And I think that when you think about the role of the Library Foundation, in many ways, we think about our work as protecting the library. It's also advancing the library and really enabling the library to do things it wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But as we see across the country and as we work with peer uh, foundations and our peers on the development side, you know, we, we really are thinking about it from what can our donors do? What do advocates do? What is our role in standing up and, and speaking up for our library and these values that are so core around intellectual freedom and access to information um, every day. That's, that, that's what the business we're in. So not only do we raise money for the library and support 45 different programs and about $5 million a year, um, including lots and lots of materials, um, all of it's done with an equity lens. But in addition to that, those investments in the library, our work does involve advocacy and whether it's advocating for more public funding, maybe it's advocating around just some of these hard topics and bringing awareness to the importance of libraries and, and the values we stand for. That's really where the foundation comes into play. Because at the end of the day, we believe in access. We believe that libraries enrich lives and that they are fundamentally essential to a healthy, healthy community. So you, again, have been key. And as donors, uh, we love you. Thank you. You're part of our donor family. Uh, if you're inspired by whether the scholarship or inspired by books on band, it certainly is areas, opportunities to invest in those with us. Another way you can support the library is with advocacy. And certainly we often call on you to, to make those calls and um, we'll continue to build our work in those areas because we want to keep the library strong. We know there's challenges facing democracy and that the library is more important than ever. And so we're going to stand with SPL, stand with Brooklyn, stand with our library peers across the country and make sure that materials and books and resources are available, especially in that sweet spot between 13 and 26, where we know that access to materials has been diminished and will just continue to be diminished if we don't do more about that. And so thanks to all of you who believe in free and equal access, your ambassadors, your advocates, and your donors, and you are key. And I hope that you think about uh, making an investment in, in these programs as well. And I, again, I just wanted to, to wrap up by saying once again, Tina Bullock, thank you for inspiring this idea. You were, it was an idea that started with you and it was one that allowed us as the foundation to honor STEM. And at the meantime, look at all these amazing students who have um, been impacted by this. And certainly the content and the role of the library uh, is fundamental to this program as well. So with that, I just want to thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, you will know and see other programming coming or, uh, your way from us. Uh, but with that, I just, uh, again, want to extend my deep appreciation. Uh, Sonia, Juliana, Eric, Kristen, Tom, thank you all. And thanks to my team for the great work you did putting this program together. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Take care. <laughs>